All right, we're on to El Nino and Southern Oscillation, a coupled ocean atmosphere system that we'll describe in more detail over the course of two videos for this week. This first one focuses on an overview of the El Nino Southern Oscillation, how we monitor it, and how we can forecast it. So let's get started. So we introduced this idea of the El Nino Southern Oscillation being comprised of interrelated, or what we call coupled, ocean and atmosphere components. That means that the ocean drives the atmosphere above, while the atmosphere drives the ocean below. The two act hand in hand with each other. It's kind of like the age old question of the chicken and the egg, which came first. Well, they both, in this case, act and come at the same time with respect to each other. So what are these ocean and atmosphere components? Well, first, and the one that we're probably most familiar with, is El Nino, and this refers to the ocean component of the ocean atmosphere system. This describes what we call a quasi-regular oscillation between two phases, a warmer than normal phase with warm equatorial central and eastern Pacific ocean temperatures, known as El Nino, and one with colder than normal near uh, surface equatorial ocean temperatures in the central and eastern Pacific Ocean, known as La Nina. So we think of them as oscillatory going from El Nino to La Nina to El Nino to La Nina. It's not very regular. There's a wide range of amounts of time that it takes to go from one to the other. One isn't always necessarily followed by the other, and they don't have the same intensity from one year to the next. So that's why we use this quasi-regular terminology. The atmosphere component is known as the Southern Oscillation, described because it was initially found to be an oscillation in sea level pressure data between two Southern Hemisphere locations within the tropics, in uh, Australia and in the South Central Pacific Ocean. So this is manifest in a wide range of atmospheric fields in the Equatorial Pacific Ocean. You name it, it probably is influenced by El Nino in some fashion. Mean sea level pressure, lower tropospheric, upper tropospheric zonal wind, also the meridional wind, though it's not listed, outgoing long wave radiation anomalies and thus precipitation, so on and so forth. So in this framing work of a coupled ocean atmosphere system, we emphasize that El Nino and La Nina, the ocean part, both cause a change in the atmosphere and are caused by a change in the atmosphere. In this case, variations in the strength of the easterly, easterly equatorial Pacific trade winds. So we've introduced before that the tropics are characterized by easterly trade winds near to the surface. So how does this, uh, how is this variable from El Nino to La Nina? We'll take a look at that as we keep moving forward. So let's consider the case of El Nino first, which is associated with weakened or reversed easterly equatorial Pacific trade winds. So I have a schematic here with the equator as the black line in the center, and we have equatorial trade winds, which for the sake of illustration, I've indicated that they are weak and westerly in this case. So these equatorial trade winds are associated with net Ekman transport, as we've described with our Walker circulation materials. This is 90 degrees to the right of the wind or the, yeah, the wind in the Northern hemisphere and 90 degrees to the left of the wind in the Southern hemisphere in the upper ocean. So we can see these purple arrows each here are directed toward the equator. So rather than the climatological state where they're directed away from the equator, here they're directed toward the equator, which water then is piled up along the equator. And ultimately from a convergence standpoint, it only has one place to go, but down. This enhanced downwelling or anomalously weak upwelling in the case where the winds are still easterly is associated with the development of warm uh, ocean temperature anomalies near the surface along the equator in the central and eastern Pacific. We replace upwelling, which causes the ocean temperature to be relatively cold here, by either weaker upwelling, which causes it to be not quite as cold, or perhaps by downwelling in the case of reversed trade winds, where we actually result in warm water over a great depth, like we typically see in the western equatorial Pacific. Whereas El La Nina here is characterized by intensified easterly equatorial Pacific trade winds. And so if we draw a similar schematic here, I've got these bigger blue arrows from the easterly direction to indicate that these are strong easterly trade winds. Ekman transport associated with these is large and away from the equator. 
And as a result, you get even more upwelling of that cold water from beneath the surface, which causes the ocean temperatures to be even colder than normal along the equator in the central and eastern equatorial Pacific Ocean. So this information about Ekman transport is not just a climatological feature of the equatorial Pacific Ocean and all of the equatorial basins for that matter, but rather it also influences El Nino versus La Nina. Changes in the atmospheric driver then feed into changes in the ocean system, which then feed back to changes in the atmospheric system, which then feed to changes in the ocean system, and so on and so forth. So let's step back and take a look at what things look like with El Nino versus La Nina. Here on the upper left, we have a depiction of sea surface temperatures with the color bar down here for one of the strongest El Ninos on record, 1997 into 1998. Here we see that there are warm ocean temperatures along the equator across the entirety of the Pacific Ocean, values exceeding 28 degrees Celsius, pushing 80 degrees Fahrenheit. Whereas La Nina, here one of the strongest La Ninas on record from 1988 to 89, here depicting the first three months of 1989, notes these very cool sea surface temperatures on the order of 25 to 26 degrees Celsius in the central and eastern equatorial Pacific Ocean. Areas to the north and to the south are still warm, but areas right along the equator are relatively cool. We can take a look at the sea surface temperature anomalies here at right for these same two events just a month prior to what is depicted uh, on the left hand side. We see very large positive anomalies, 5 to 10 degrees Fahrenheit along the equator extending from South America into the central equatorial Pacific Ocean during the El Nino event. And we see colder than normal sea surface temperature anomalies extending across from South America into the central equatorial Pacific Ocean during the strong La Nina event. So these patterns that we see here, warm everywhere for El Nino, with positive sea surface temperature anomalies where it is typically relatively cold. Cold over the entirety of the central and eastern equatorial Pacific for La Nina with colder than normal sea surface temperatures in those regions. These are pretty consistent from one El Nino event and one La Nina event to the other. However, the intensity of these will vary between those events. So we can take a look at an amalgam of multiple events. We have six El Nino events here at left and six La Nina events here at right. And we're looking at the sea surface temperature anomalies associated with each. So if we put a box along the equator extending across the central and eastern equatorial Pacific, and we'll come into more details about that in a few moments here, and just average the sea surface temperature anomalies within that box, we can get these time series here, where we go from January of one year to January of the next year, and then January of a year after that. So each one of these is a two year period where this January of year one uh, is, or January of year plus one, is indicating the January in which the uh, El Nino or the La Nina event is strongest. Year zero is when it begins to develop. Year two is two years after that time period. So we find that each of these have very similar evolutions just mirrored about the y-axis. You have a developing El Nino that reaches peak intensity during the Northern Hemisphere winter, Southern Hemisphere summer months, and then decays thereafter, albeit at very significantly different rates from one event to the next. Whereas for La Nina, we see that the sea surface cools leading into its peak intensity also during the Northern Hemisphere winter, Southern Hemisphere summer, and then that anomaly decays, albeit at very different rates from one event to the next. We do see that these El Nino events, these curves all peak between about one and a half and two and a half degrees Celsius, whereas here it's not quite as significant of a negative anomaly for La Nina. The strongest El Nino events do tend to be stronger in terms of the magnitude anomalies than do the strongest La Nina events. But there's substantial variability. We see these curves all departing substantially. This yellow one maintains warm anomalies for quite a long period of time. This dark brown one goes from very strongly positive warm anomalies to very strongly negative cold anomalies over a short period of time. So there's substantial variability from one event to the next. And this is true for both El Nino and La Nina, although we see it more notably for these six uh, El Nino events than we do see for these six La Nina events here at right.
El Nino and La Nina don't just affect the sea surface temperatures, but they also affect the subsurface, near surface ocean temperatures as well. So we have a cross section along the equator during the 1997 to 1998 El Nino event, starting in January 1997 with so-called normal or neutral conditions, neither El Nino or La Nina was present. Then we have El Nino here uh, 10 months later in November 1997. And then six months later, we're going away from El Nino toward a developing La Nina event. So the depth increases going down and we're looking over the uppermost several hundred feet of the ocean. So this reduced upwelling or anomalous downwelling, as we would see during the development of an El Nino event, that keeps the cold water down further in the ocean. It inhibits it from being brought upward toward the ocean surface. Downwelling, in fact, takes the warm water at the surface that piles up along the equator and directs that downward as well. So you get this substantial difference in the depth of the warm ocean waters, not just warmth at the surface, but to a much greater depth than just the surface as you go from neutral conditions over to El Nino conditions. And this is true over the first several hundred feet of the uppermost ocean. You still have cold water at even deeper altitudes where it's less affected by El Nino and La Nina, but this uppermost ocean has substantial changes between normal and El Nino. Note that the far western equatorial Pacific in these two maintain relatively warm conditions. You don't see the uh, ocean temperatures to, as warm to quite a substantial of a depth, however, because the downwelling as the water piles up along the western shores of the Pacific, you don't have as much of that because the trade winds have weakened or have reversed. However, when you go to La Nina, the opposite is the case. Those trade winds become stronger, and so this warm anomaly erodes. We see that already taking place as La Nina is just beginning to develop here in this example at right. This picture would come back around to looking like this normal state, and then would become an even augmented or enhanced version of this normal state as you get to a strong La Nina event with deeper, warmer water in the far western equatorial Pacific and cooler, shallower water uh, in terms of the depth of the warm water here in the central and eastern equatorial Pacific. El Nino and La Nina cause substantial variability in the Walker circulation. So this is a manifestation of the oceanic influence back to the atmosphere. So here at the top, we have a depiction for El Nino, and here at the bottom, we have a depiction for La Nina. The color shading of brown and green here is temperature differences, warmer than average in the yellow or brown, cooler than average in the green. We also have indications for the descending branches of the Walker circulation with the downward arrows and the ascending branches associated with the uh, thunderstorm activity. And so focusing on the Pacific Ocean, as we see here, we see during El Nino, we have anomalous ascent taking place in the central to eastern equatorial Pacific, where the ocean temperature is relatively warm. So we've shifted the locus of where the ocean is relatively warm eastward in the equatorial Pacific Ocean. And that causes the Walker circulation upward branch to be centered there, rather than its climatological location in the western Pacific Ocean. So we get strong ascent here, and we get compensating descent away from there to the west and to the east. Whereas during La Nina, it's even colder than normal in the equatorial Pacific in the central and eastern portion of the basin. And this is a region where we typically see descending motion as the ascent is focused in the western portion of the Pacific Ocean. And so because it is relatively cold there, you get even stronger descending motion there. So you get something that looks like the normal Walker circulation, just much intensified because of the stronger temperature contrast between the relatively warm conditions of the Western Pacific and the relatively cold conditions of the Central and Eastern Pacific. These differences, as you might expect, where you have enhanced ascent, you would expect to see enhanced precipitation. Where you have enhanced descent, you would expect to see reduced precipitation. And the changes in where these uh, upward branches and the associated latent heat release associated, driven by the thunderstorms also have influences on the larger scale uh, changes that result from El Nino and La Nina events.
So that's a lot about how we can see El Nino and La Nina in terms of ocean conditions, and we'll come back to that in just a few moments here as well. But let's take a step back into the atmospheric side and look to see how we can monitor El Nino and La Nina, or more formally, the Southern Oscillation, utilizing atmospheric data. The most common way of being able to do this is through what is known as the Southern Oscillation Index. And when we're dealing with indices across the atmospheric sciences, it's usually some field, in this case mean sea level pressure, that is just averaged over some box, whether that be in space, in time, or both. And in this case, it's going to be a difference between Tahiti and Darwin. So here we have this pressure difference defined as the sea level pressure at Tahiti, here at about 15 south and 150 degrees west, minus the sea level pressure at Darwin, here at about 11 degrees south and 130 degrees east. We use that quantity, which we can measure at the same time each day or average it over the course of a day, as input to the Southern Oscillation Index that we see here. So this pressure difference shows up right here, and that's a daily or an hourly, uh, whatever time scale you're looking at, quantity. We subtract from that what the climatological, the long-term average of that pressure difference would be. Typically, it is warmer in the equatorial western Pacific than it is in the equatorial central and eastern Pacific. And so consequently, sea level pressure is typically lower in Darwin. If we think about it from a thickness perspective, those near surface pressure surfaces are directed downward uh, where it is warmer, and they're directed upward where it is cooler, uh, as we would see in Darwin and Tahiti respectively. So this climatological pressure difference larger value minus smaller value is going to be positive. So during El Nino, when it is warmer than normal here in Tahiti, this pressure is going to be lower than normal. Pressure at Darwin may not change substantially, but if you make the first term of this smaller, this is going to be less positive or even negative as compared to that climatological version. So you'll have a less positive or negative value here minus a positive value here, and that will give you a negative value. Whereas this denominator here is just depicting the average variation, uh, the standard deviation specifically in that climatological pressure difference. So the numerator is what governs the sign here. And when that pressure at Tahiti is relatively low, driven by the warming of the ocean waters nearby associated with El Nino events, you get a negative value for the Southern Oscillation Index. Whereas for La Nina, and I apologize that this one line here is getting cut off by the top of my screen, or by my top of my camera, I should say. The typical pattern of cold east and warm west is accentuated. So the sea level pressure here at Tahiti is even higher than normal as compared to Darwin. So this difference becomes even larger positive. So you have a large positive minus something that is not quite as large of a positive, and thus consequently the Southern Oscillation Index is positive during La Nina events. So we can take a look at long time series of these. Uh, we have up at the top, the uh, Southern Oscillation Index here uh, along the top axis. We have zero uh, with this black solid line across from 1978 through later in 2008. And then we have the corresponding sea surface temperature anomalies in the East Central Equatorial Pacific Ocean at the equator in 110 degrees west longitude. And we see that there's a robust inverse relationship between the two lines. Where this top line goes down, the bottom line goes up. Where the top line goes up, the bottom line goes down, and on from there. So when the sea surface temperature anomal is anomalously warm, so we have indications of that here in 1982-1983, and here in 1997-1998, we ascribe this to being associated with El Nino, and we see that this happens to be cases where the Southern Oscillation Index is very strongly negative. So we said before, El Nino, negative SOI, positive sea surface temperature anomalies, and we see that bear out in these data here.
Conversely, when sea surface temperature is anomalously cool, there aren't as many notable cases of this within the data here. The best one that shows up here is probably 1988 to 1989. We see that the Southern Oscillation Index is positive or anomalously high, as we expected from before. So negative sea surface temperature anomalies, positive Southern Oscillation Index for La Nina. When we look at El Nino and its southern oscillation in terms of sea surface temperature, we're often averaging our sea surface temperature anomalies over some box or some region. And we have four different of those boxes depicted here, labeled Nino followed by some number. In this case, this is one and two, this is three, this is 3.4, and this is four. 3.4 gets its name because it's about 40% of 4 and 60% of 3, the dividing line of which is depicted here. So we're looking at different regions along the equator, primarily in the central and eastern equatorial Pacific Ocean, to be able to help us monitor the structure of a given El Nino or La Nina event. This dashed red line for the Nino 3.4 region is the most commonly used region for monitoring sea surface temperature anomalies associated with El Nino and La Nina. And this, the bounds on this region specifically are 5 south to 5 north, 120 to 170 degrees west. So confined near the equator over a 50 degree longitude, almost 5,000 kilometers, over 5,000 kilometers in fact, region in the central to eastern equatorial Pacific. If we take the sea surface temperature anomalies within that region, the Nino 3.4 region, and average them, we get a measure of this oceanic Nino index. And this is the most common ocean-based metric to monitor the El Nino Southern Oscillation. And we have a graph of the last 21 or so years of the oceanic Nino index depicted here at left, where zero is depicting neutral or average conditions, positive are El Nino, and negative are La Nina, associated with warmer and colder than normal sea surface temperature anomalies, respectively. We formally define this oceanic Nino index not on a day-to-day -day basis, but rather using a three-month average of the sea surface temperature anomalies in that Nino 3.4 region. So we know that El Nino and that La Nina are slowly varying, and so rather than considering daily data, which are not going to be substantially different from one day to the next anyway, we consider this longer time period worth of data to be able to assist our monitoring process. So here we're considering this in February February 2022, or whatever month you may be watching this video, you would be looking at December, or sorry, November, December, January for the most recent completed three month period for February if you are watching the video at that time. We require that the sea surface temperature anomaly magnitude exceed a half degree Celsius, whether that be plus half or minus half for El Nino and La Nina respectively, for at least a five month period. So we have a three month average and that three month average must exceed 0.5 Celsius for each of five consecutive months for an event to be classified as El Nino or La Nina. And then the strength of the event is directly related to how large that average sea surface temperature anomaly would be. 0.5 uh, plus and minus Celsius is the minimum threshold for a weak El Nino or a weak La Nina. Once you get above one Celsius plus and minus, you start to get into the moderate intensity range. And once you get above plus and minus two degrees Celsius, you get into the strong intensity range. Although those thresholds are somewhat subjective. We can add on here uh, solid black lines at the half degree plus and minus thresholds. And I've labeled all of the El Nino events since 2000 with red stars. A couple of them are relatively close, especially this one here in 2006, 2007, with only about five months that meet the criteria. But we have a very strong uh, El Nino here in 2015, 2016 that shows up very, very nicely. Likewise, I've labeled all of the La Nina events here with blue stars, a few of them as well. This one here in 2006, this one here in 2017, or 2018, sorry, are relatively weak. This one here in 2017 doesn't quite meet the threshold of five consecutive months. We see strong La Nina events in 2008, uh, and then again in 2010 into 2011. 
and we're just now coming out of a moderate one here in 2021 into 2022. So finally, we briefly describe how El Nino and its southern oscillation can be forecasted. And there are two different types of models that can be used to predict El Nino southern oscillation. Dynamical models, these are models that solve for both the ocean and the atmosphere above, utilizing the predictive equations, equations of motion, thermodynamic equation for the atmosphere and moisture equation, ideal gas law, so on and so forth. So these are based off of physical and dynamical principles that govern the evolution of quantities within the atmosphere and within the ocean. And they're set up in such a way so that one can affect the other. There's also statistical models that are purely statistically based. They don't actually incorporate physics and dynamics into them. They only incorporate statistical uh, relationships that come out of those, at least hopefully they do. So we have a depiction here of forecasts from January 2022 from a Columbia University resource, the International Research Institute. All of these filled in boxes along the lines are different dynamical models and all of the open circles along the lines are different statistical models. And there's not necessarily reason to favor one model over the other necessarily within a given classification. Historically, statistical models worked better than dynamical models, although that has changed quite a bit within the last decade or so. Now the skill of each of them is relatively similar. And as we see here, starting from the starting point of December 2021 and progressing outward in the future, the models have a lot of similarities in terms of their predicted sea surface temperature evolutions. And that's what's depicted here on the y-axis, the Nino 3.4 sea surface temperature anomaly, depicting this La Nina event gradually weakening through the course of the spring into the summer months of 2022. <clears throat> Both types of models are relatively skillful once you have an event already in place, but they have less skill in predicting event transitions. And the skill is particularly low in the winter and early spring, when you are likely watching this video, in fact, due to what is known as the spring predictability barrier. And our Canvas course website has a great link to a NOAA climate resource on the spring predictability barrier, describing why it is such a pain in terms of accurately forecasting El Nino versus La Nina. We don't really have a good handle as to why the spring predictability barrier exists and what it might take for it to be able to be overcome, however. So with all that in mind, we've uh, finished our overview video of El Nino and La Nina and the broader atmospheric component, the Southern Oscillation. When we get into our next video, we're gonna take a look at some dynamical theories associated with El Nino and La Nina, as well as the larger scale impacts associated with El Nino and La Nina events.